good morning. Good to see everyone today, and so glad you are with us. I need to make you aware of just a few announcements. There has been a little bit of confusion about what the board is with the envelopes on it going out the door. It's been a couple of years since we did that, so that's why there's confusion. But it's a sponsorship board for our youth, uh, youth camps. Uh, so anyway, if you are interested in helping... Uh, with that at all, you just take an envelope, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, all the way up to 100, or take 10 envelopes, whatever you want to do. Uh, you can take those and bring back uh, an envelope, a, a check or some money in there, and that will go towards our youth events, our youth camps, and things like that. All right. Um, also, uh, you'll see a list of the Vacation Bible School workers that are needed. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So if you want to help, sign up at the table out the, uh, the door on, uh, by the welcome desk or see Pastor Josh, and he will take care of that. Um, also, there are some important summer dates listed in the bulletin there. Um, and you will see in your bulletin this uh, form right here. If you didn't get one, I'd appreciate if you get one. This is just an opportunity for you to let the nominating committee know uh, the areas where you might be willing to serve. So that's what this is. Take one, fill it out. We'll have a box out there by the collection plate starting next week, and you can bring those back and drop them off. We don't know where to plug you in if you don't tell us where you would consider serving, right? All right. So uh, also there is a special called uh, business meeting, church conference, on Wednesday night after the Bible study for the purpose of voting on an upgrade to our sound system. Uh, and you see this uh, biography here of Alan Sibley. Alan prayed last week. Wave at us, Alan. Um, and he prayed in place of Mark Bragg. Mark, wave at us. Mark is going to pray today, and he's our deacon candidate uh, that we highlighted last week. Uh, so be aware of that. Um, I believe that um, I had one other announcement. Oh, the pictures. If you had your picture made last week and you did not receive an email yesterday or last night, uh, there's a chance that your email got entered incorrectly. So you will need to see Pastor Bobby. Pastor Bobby. Here's the way this is going to work. Uh, the 8 by 10 that you get for free will be here sometime this week. We'll have it maybe by Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, but... When you go into that online album via your email that you receive, you can download whatever picture she took for free. So you don't have to pay anything extra for whatever picture she took. But the 8 by 10 will be here later this week. So if you did not get an email, check your email today and contact Pastor Bobby, and he will get you squared away. But I think everybody got their emails. All right? All right. I think that's everything. Y'all ready to worship? Enough of the commercial announcements. Let's stand.
Father, thank you so much, dear Lord, for this day. Just thank you for this opportunity to come before you and worship and praise your name, dear Lord. We thank you so much for how you've continued to bless us through this time. Pray, dear Lord, that you be with these graduates for getting ready to honor. Just pray that you continue to wreck their past, dear Lord, and help them to seek your will for their life. Just pray that you be with pastors. He brings the message this morning. Open our hearts and minds to receive it, dear Lord. We thank you for all you're going to do for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, it's exciting to be able to be up here again at this time of the year. For those of you that are visiting, I'm Pastor David. I'm the Youth uh, Missions and Outreach Pastor, and it's my honor and my privilege to be able to do graduate recognition for year 2021. It's an exciting time in the year of these students because they're finishing, at least partly. Uh, and you'll understand why that, and if you look in your bulletins. If you look in your bulletins, there's a sheet that lists our graduates this year. There's nine of them. And instead of spending 25 minutes of telling you all what's going on in their lives, what they've accomplished, what they're going to seek to accomplish, I put that in the bulletin that you can take with you and just keep and remember. So at so this time, we get to actually recognize them for the accomplishment that they have made to this point. And it's an accomplishment. Because at this point, it's not what they have to do. It's what they chose to do. It's what they were led to do. They actually worked for this. And it's something to honor. It's something to praise. And it's something that God should put in our hearts to cheer on and encourage those who have done this and to continue as a legacy to those still to come. And so now, 
let's recognize our graduates. Starting with high school. Again, let me stop this. We have folks graduating not only from high school, but from college and graduate school this year. So it's a great amount of work being done. Our first graduate this year that we're going to recognize is graduating high school from Trinity Christian School with honors, Miss Sydney Bragg. <laughs> Our second student graduating from Noonan High School is Miss Caitlin Tucker. We have three high school graduates who are unable to be here today, but we want to recognize them none the same. First of all, graduate, all three of them are actually related, and they're all graduating from Noonan College, or Noonan High School. Thank you for that. I knew I was going to mess something up up here. I told Pastor Josh, I'm going to mess something up. Anyway, first off is, I believe, Miss Chloe Craft. Secondly, again, they're related, they're all part of the thing, is, uh, I believe it's Mills. Yep, Mills Maddox. <laughs> awesome. And then yet again related, Miss Meredith Medlock. If you're not sure who these are, they are all related to Art and uh, Carol Craft. They're all grandchildren of theirs, and so we want to make sure we let them know that we're excited for them and praying for their students as well. Uh, that's our high school graduating class, but we have several that are graduating from college as well. And these three right here have done a ton of work, by the way. Like their bulletins part, I'm like, I have to leave stuff out. I'm sorry because there's not enough paper in our church. Um, and so they've been really, really busy. And we want to make sure we uh, give them their due credit as well. I believe our first one is uh, Miss Caitlin Cannon, who is not able to be with us today. She's graduating from LaGrange College uh, with a degree in nursing. So that's awesome. <laughs> Very closely related to her uh, within minutes is her sister Stephanie Cannon, graduating from the University of Georgia. And you can see she's busy because the extra tassels and cords and stuff I, n I never got. <laughs> it's okay. I'm not, I'm not upset. Graduating from Toccoa Falls College, Miss Rachel Bassett. <laughs> now, I can't remember, but these graduates, all three of them from, uh, from college, either graduated magna cum laude or summa cum laude, which means they were at the absolute top of their class, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> we have one more graduate to recognize, and this one you will recognize very evidently, and this person has been absolutely diligent in their studies to finish his Master's of Arts in uh, Christian Family and Children's Ministry, Pastor Josh Casey. <laughs> All right. This is a graduating class of 2021. Let's honor them and celebrate them now. And while you're standing there before you sit down, I think the greatest way we can honor these students is to remember to pray for them as God leads them in their next steps. So if you will, this is going to sound awkward. Reach your hands out like you're putting your hands on them, and we're going to pray over these uh, individuals. Lord, we just want to thank you for these students. Thank you for their lives, their impact that they're going to have in your kingdom. We want to thank you for their diligence and their hard work and their perseverance through the times that were no doubt struggles but yet they followed through with what path you had set before them, and much of them with great vigor and tenacity, seeking to honor you greatly in all that they do. We ask that you continue to pour out blessings on them as the Holy Spirit pours out truth in their life and leads them forward to their next stages, and that we as a church commit to praying for them, not just today, but from here on as they seek your will in their lives in their further education or career path where they go. Lord, thank you again for these students. Thank you for the time that we can honor and praise them for their accolades. It's in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. And so at this time, we want to invite all the students to come, or students, all the children to come up for Children's Moment. Pastor Josh has another role to fill today. He's busy today. 
So come on up. It is time for children's, our children's moment. Thank you. And I need some a volunteer. Ooh, a volunteer. All right, let's put your energy to work. All right. Now, you've got to follow directions just right, okay? I'm going to get you to put this shirt on over your shirt. And you've got to button it up, but you can only use one hand. Oh, my God. Okay? I'll help you get it over. Oh, yeah, and the sleeves are really long. All right. Turn around so they can see you. All right, now you can only use one hand to button up the shirt. And while you're doing that, you can't reach. Okay, well, I mean, you've got to work it out. Somehow you've got to do with this. Well, you know what? Is it hard to button up your shirt with one hand? Yeah. Especially when it doesn't fit just right? Yeah. Well, let's, let's try this. I'm going to come alongside you, and I'm going to help you. Okay? And we're going to work together. You can use either hand, but you can only use one at a time. Okay? To do this. It's quite funny, isn't it? Well, did you know? Whoops, stand up. All right, stand up. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret. You can use both hands now and see if you can get it buttoned then. This is way too big. It is too big because it fits me. And the, the fact that it's a man's shirt and not a girl's shirt, the buttons are on a different side, so that's probably confusing you too. No, I had a shirt like this, I think. Well, did you know that it's easier for her to button up the shirt with, with both hands instead of one? Instead of one, you're right. Because she's used to using both hands. God gave her two hands for a reason. He gave us two eyes for a reason. Because He wants us to use both eyes and both hands and he wants us to use both ears and he wants us to use our heart and he wants us to use our feet as well yeah, and to, yes but you know what the family of Christ this church is just like that if we work together it makes telling other people who about who Jesus is so much easier the Bible even tells us that in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, it says, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts, one body, and we all belong to each other. Boys and girls, we are all part of one body of Christ. And we're all made for something very special and very specific. Just like this hand and this hand work together to team. button up as a team. That's right. To button up the sh our shirts, you and I need to work together to tell others about Christ. I can't even buy it on All right. <laughs> Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father God, I thank you for today, and I thank you for the opportunity to share others, share Christ with others to share your good news with those that we come in contact with. And I thank you for the friends and the family that we have that are there with us to help share that good news. Lord, I pray that we will spend the rest of today learning more about you and following you closely. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I got kind of good. <laughs> you did? All right. That is great. It's now it's time to go to Children's Church. As our children make their way, let me ask you to stand and join together singing this great song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God my Father.
pray. Lord God Almighty, you are our creator, our savior, and you are so very faithful to us. Lord, whatever we go through, Lord, you are there every step of the way. The good times when we accomplish the goal like graduation, Lord, you are with us. And each and every day when sometimes it's just hard to get through the task we have to do. Lord, sometimes we come, we come here on Sunday after going through a week of bad news and, and trials and tribulations, Lord, and we're, we're not where we're supposed to be. But Lord God, we get among your people. We get among you. We pray to you. And we feel your assurance. We feel your love. And we get recharged. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us each and every day. Lord, help us to share this with those around us. Lord, I thank you for the saints that have gone before us, Lord, that has built this church. A place where we can have this fellowship. Lord, I thank you for the seniors here today that lead and guide us, that give us good information, Lord, on how to walk with you each and every day. Lord, help us to be a help to someone else. Lord, help us to lift each other up as we lift you up in praise. And thank you for being our God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Praise the Lord. You can turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Last week we looked at the truth surrounding our adoption as children into the family of God. Once we were not a people of God, but now we are a people of God. Once we were condemned, once we were cut off, once we were totally outside the kingdom of God with no hope for redemption in our own selves, no hope for reconciliation to God, and yet God, who is rich in mercy and love, sent his Son of love, Jesus Christ, as the remedy to our problem. And those who were once condemned and enslaved by the law of sin and death have now been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ to walk in the Spirit of God, to live life in the Spirit. How can we do that? Well, we've been made alive. We've been born again. We once were dead, but now we're alive. We once were lost, but now we're found. And as such, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us. And as a result of the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in us, then we can live in the Spirit Today we began to talk about our incredible inheritance in the Lord and our incomparable glory that we are ushered in to be a part of as a result of our salvation. Perhaps you're here today, perhaps you're searching for answers in this life, perhaps you're searching for truth, perhaps you have looked around at the world and you have been searching for some type of meaning or purpose in this life and you have found that wanting. Perhaps you are longing, perhaps you are needing, perhaps you are desperately feeling and searching around for answers. There's only one answer, one solution, one remedy for whatever ails you, and that's Jesus. 
Don't get me wrong, the world seeks to come up with all these answers, and the world seeks to, to uh, program our brains in such a way to think that we can somehow think amongst ourselves and come up with solutions. But Jesus is the only way. And so I thought I would do something that I don't normally do during the introduction of one of these lessons. I thought I'd just tell you about this great plan and purpose of God. The Bible teaches that every person that has ever been born because of the sin of Adam after Adam you remember we looked at this in Romans chapter 5 when uh, it says death spread to all because of Adam's one transgressions, uh, one transgression, death spread to the world. All people that have ever been born are sinners. And the world would have us to believe that everyone is good and it must be the environment that corrupts, but the Bible teaches that we're all sinners. And we're not sinners just because we've descended from Adam. We're sinners because we've sinned. Because we, we lied to our parents when we were kids. And we stole the cookie from the cookie jar. Or the candy from my candy bag. We don't have to be taught to sin. We're sinners. And we know how to sin. Everyone's a sinner. And the Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death. In our passage in Romans that we looked at in Romans chapter 6, the wages of sin is death. What does that mean? Death is eternal death. It's eternal punishment. Do you know that we're going to live forever? All of us had a beginning, but we're going to live forever. And you're going to live forever either with God or in hell, paying for your sins. Because the wages of sin is death. What we've earned by our sin is death forever. Because we have to understand that sin is an infinite offense against God. And the Bible says if we committed one sin, we're guilty of them all. Why is that? Because one sin is an infinite offense before God and deserves eternal punishment. And so we have earned the right to go to hell because of our sin. But God, again, was not content to leave us in this situation. And so before the foundation of the world, before he ever even created the earth, before he created you and me, he devised a plan, not plan B, not a response to what we've done, but plan A from the beginning was always to send his son, Jesus Christ, who is God, who is also a human being, to die on the cross for our sins in our place as our substitute. That's important. Because because of your sin, someone has to die. Whether it be you for all eternity in hell, or whether it be Jesus on the cross for your sins. So Jesus came to offer his life as a substitute, as a sacrifice for our sins. And he took our punishment and the Bible says that the key to receiving this gift is faith. Believe in your heart. Understand the truth. Believe in your heart that Jesus died in your place and you will be saved. Amen. And it's not difficult. The gospel is not difficult to understand. We're sinners. We deserve to go to hell. Jesus came lived a perfect and sinless life so that he could die in our place as the infinite God-man. We receive that gift by faith, call out to God and say, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell, but I'm calling on you to die in my place, and I receive it by faith. And whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. So it's not that difficult of a concept to understand. But we also must understand it's not simply mentally assenting to this truth. It's an active trust. Faith is an active trust. We throw everything 
on Christ and saying, save me, Lord. Not just, ah, well, I believe it, so I'm going to heaven. No, it's, it's a heart decision, a genuine repentance. That is, turning away from our sin and a genuine turning to God. And the Bible says that whenever we receive Christ as our Savior, that the Spirit of God comes to live in us, and the Spirit testifies within us that we are children of God. Verse 16 of Romans chapter 8, And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. The Spirit comes to dwell in us and makes us alive. That's what the concept of being born again is, to be made alive in Christ. And as a result, we receive the glorious benefits of being a child of God and adopted into his family. And those are the things that we're going to talk about today. So if you're here this morning and you're searching, if you're here this morning and you're struggling, if you're here this morning and you don't know the answers to to life's questions, I'm going to tell you the answer is you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus. He is the only way. The things of this world, they're lies, people. They do not provide real lasting meaning. They burn up and rust away. And so let's examine the glorious benefits of being God's child, the indescribable guarantees of the Holy Spirit that he gives to us because we are children of the King, children of glory. Romans chapter 8 verse 17, stand with me. As we read these two verses this morning, let me go back and read verse 16 to show you where we were and then uh, move on into the concept that we're going to look at today. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Amen Amen and amen and glory to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words of Scripture. We thank you for the words of life. We pray, God, that you will just, uh, in this moment, show us the incomparable glory and the incredible inheritance that we are a part of. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Whether you know it or not, if you're a believer, you live in the light of God's glory. John explains this truth in 1 John chapter 3 and 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. What does it mean to be a part of a family? I don't know if you guys had many family traditions growing up, we had several on my, my dad's side of the family, my mom's side of the family. One of my favorite traditions that we had growing up was that we would have these big, gigantic birthday parties every month where we would go to my grandmother's. And um, March was always the fullest because I was in it. Uh, but there was a bunch of other people, my grandmother's birthday, uh, my uncle's birthday, my cousin's. Uh, my other cousins, and, and so they'd get this huge cake and write all our names on it. And we would barbecue chicken, and we would eat chicken, and we would eat cake, and we would spend the whole day just being together as a family. Tradition, right? I enjoyed those times, enjoyed getting together. And we would go to my other grandmothers, and I loved being there too. Oh, it was great, but they had chicken salad all the time. I didn't like that too much. And today I've swore off chicken salad. I just said, chicken salad chick? No, not for me. You know? Huh? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But anyway, 
We had these traditions that we loved, these traditions that meant something to us. And we got an opportunity to see the family at that time and spend time together. And these things are important. So being part of a family is great. Don't you have some traditions with your family? But as much fun as it is to be a part of an earthly family, how much more awesome is it to be a part of God's family, to have God's glory showered all around us, to be walking in God's purpose, to be adopted into the kingdom of God, for nothing can compare to that glory. In fact, listen to me and listen closely. It's what you were created for. It's why God created you to walk in His glory. And it's our ultimate purpose for belonging. Our ultimate purpose for existing. And nothing that we experience in our earthly families can match the incredible inheritance and the incomparable glory of being part of an eternal family. And so those are our two points today. First is this, the Christian's incredible inheritance. Verse 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Because we are adopted, we receive an incredible inheritance. Look at the wording, if children then heirs. A lot of times we see that word if and we understand it to mean that something is conditional. If you behave, I'll get you some ice cream. Now I wasn't talking to y'all, okay? But that's what we tell our kids sometimes. But in this particular case, the if deals with the cause and effect. If, in fact, you are a child of God, then you will definitely be an heir of God. Believers are children of God, and as such, believers are heirs of God. Joint heirs with Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be an heir? Well, there is one qualifier in this verse. It says heirs of God. You know, to be an heir can mean a lot of things. You know, my children, to be an heir of me means I'm going to spend all my inheritance that I have left over for them, and they're going to get nothing. Right? So there's a qualifier, right? I have some religious books and Christian books that they can share and fight over and uh, that kind of thing. But, you know, you can't take it with you, right? So may as well spend it. No, but it depends on who you're an heir of, right? I mean, if you were an heir of, say, uh, the uh, Tesla guy, Musk, you'd probably have some Bill Gates or something. You'd probably have something left over. Well, his wife is going to get... Well, anyway, that's another story. <laughs> depends on who you're an heir of, right? So if you're an heir of someone that doesn't have anything, that may not mean as much, but if you're an heir of someone that has a lot, that may mean more on this earth, but we're heirs of God. There's something different about that. We have an inheritance that's beyond comparison. It's incredible. And so whenever you talk about being an heir of God, what you're talking about is that there is a source of our inheritance. It's not of this world, it's of God. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 34 says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. By the way, I had a church that used to fight over which side the sheep sat on and which side the goats sat on. It was, it was always funny. They were always pointing at the other side as the goats. And then he goes on to say, And he will place his sheep on the right and his goats on the left. 
Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You say, it's pretty clear where the sheep and the goats are. Why was that church fighting? Well, they were trying to always determine whether it was from the perspective of the pulpit or the perspective of the back of the room, whether it was the left or the right. So they had a fun time arguing over that. But the truth is, we all want to be sheep, don't we? Because we all want to receive the inheritance that has been prepared before the foundation of the world. And listen to what it says. As believers, God, who doesn't need us, God, who is everything, look at what it says. Come, you who are blessed by the Father, that is, the children of God, the adopted into his family, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. before the foundation of the world. God doesn't adopt people into his family as an afterthought. It's not sheer happenstance that we are part of the kingdom. It was always part of the plan from the foundation of the world. So don't you know that the worth of your inheritance is not dependent on the person who receives it? Praise God. You don't get an inheritance based on the worth of yourself. You get an inheritance based on the worth of the one leaving behind the inheritance. And so praise God that he is the one who is giving it. Aren't you glad that God doesn't give you what you deserve? God, the creator of the universe, the sustainer of the universe, the deliverer, of his church. He is not only the source of our inheritance, but get this, he is our inheritance. What do we get? We get to walk with God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and listen to this, fellow heirs with Christ. Christ is limitless in his character. God is limitless in his character, and yet we are fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. And basically what this says is that we will receive everything that Christ receives. We will reign with him? That doesn't even make sense. Believers receive a full share of the inheritance. When I, when I pass on, my kids are going to have to divide up $2.25 amongst themselves. Maybe three twenty-five dollars if I invest wisely. But believers, we get the full share. Everyone gets a full share of the inheritance. There's nothing to be divided because God gives us everything. We're all firstborn children because of Christ. Our righteousness is not our own. It's God's righteousness through Christ in us. Now understand this. We'll not be gods when we get to heaven. We won't be Jesus. But we will receive all the blessings and the glory of the Lord. It's not our own glory. It's God's glory on us. It's not an intrinsic glory. It's an extrinsic that's been placed on us. So Titus 3, 7 says, So that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. <coughs> Paul has already said that those who set their mind, uh, those who are believers set their mind on the things of God, and those who are of the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. And since we look forward to our glorious inheritance, the faithful believer should also be a fruitful believer. Because God has showered his glory upon us in this life and will fully shower it in the next, we should be fruitful in this life. 
And so we should set our mind on the things of God, a heavenly mindset. Have you ever heard that statement that sometimes we're so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good? We need to be so heavenly minded that we're plenty of earthly good, sharing the message of the gospel with those who are lost. And then he goes on to say this, the spirit himself, I'm sorry, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Sometimes I think we get the idea that this life, uh, whenever we come to Christ, there will be no suffering. But my friend, this world is under the dominion of sin, under the dominion of Satan. Satan hates the people of God, therefore he attacks at every turn. And the more we serve God, the more he attacks. The more we live in this world, the more the effects of sin is all around us. We face suffering, we face physical suffering and health issues. We face uh, persecution and attacks increasingly uh, in our world today. But remember, it is not because they necessarily hate us. Christ said, if they hate me, they'll hate you. And so they really hate Christ. Guess what? The suffering in this life offers proof that we are children of God. <laughs> Lord, I could do without a side of suffering. But suffering provides proof that we are children of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 to 11 says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Christ suffered for the sake of his children, and we should be willing to suffer for his sake. In fact, the Bible doesn't say if you suffer. The Bible says when you suffer. The Christian's incredible inheritance. Secondly, the Christian's incomparable glory. Look at verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. This should be a great comfort to us as believers. When Paul says he has considered, he's saying that he's carefully contemplated and reasoned on the matter. That he's carefully contemplated the suffering that we go through in this life. And his conclusion, suffering in this life is but a small price to pay for the glorious, incomparable glory that we will experience with God forever for all eternity. How many feel like you've been going through some suffering right now in your life? And the suffering that we go through in this present life are not really worth being compared to the future glory that will be revealed. Why? Because the scales are infinitely glorious and only momentarily suffering. Disease, ailments that debilitate us in this life, loved ones pass on, violence, Heard about some more shootings in Atlanta this weekend. Heard about some in our own community recently. Death, war. Rockets are flying over in the Middle East yet again. Slander. Malice, division. All types of suffering. 
And we might be tempted to think that living under the God of the universe, we would be immune from all this suffering. However, if you think about it in terms of logic, if Christ, who is God, was required to suffer, why not us? If God, wrapped in flesh, came to this earth and was not immune from the suffering wrought about by sin, in fact, as a result of sin, he died and suffered on the cross and then suffered the wrath of God being poured out on him in that moment. Something that those who believe will never have happen to them. And why do we think that we are somehow immune from suffering? If the world is hostile to Christ, it certainly will be hostile to those who bear his name. And Christ is our supreme example of suffering. You want to know how to suffer properly? Just do what Christ did. Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the way we're called to suffer. And so this gives us great hope in the midst of suffering, in the midst of difficulty. Suffering in this life comes from humanity. But glory, incomparable glory, comes from God. So here's the main question that I would ask you today. Will you receive incomparable glory and incredible inheritance? Or is the suffering that you're going through simply in vain? Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher, the prince of preachers, used to tell a story about a famous tailor who was on his deathbed. Those gathered around him in the end wanted to find out why the man and how the man had been so successful in his life. And so they said, what is the secret to your success? By the way, for those of you that don't know exactly what a tailor is, that's a person that makes clothes. It's a factory now. What is the secret to your success, oh, famous tailor? And his answer was simple. He said, always put a knot in the end of your thread. Do you have a knot in the end of your thread? Do you have Jesus in the end of your thread? Those who do not have a knot in their thread are going through life and accomplishing nothing. They have no hope. They're just slipping through the fabric over and over again without any footing, without any standing. But when Jesus ties a knot in our thread of his accomplishment on the cross, we can accomplish much in this life and we can anticipate great glory in the next. Have you built your life on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or are you building your life on the foundation of the ways of the world? My friend, these things pass away. And if our thread has a knot in it, it doesn't matter what Satan throws at us. It doesn't matter how difficult life can seem to be. When we have built our lives on the foundation of the gospel, we have everything. And we are guaranteed a source that is God that gives us an incredible inheritance and an incomparable glory. So I shared with you the gospel earlier today, and I'll just ask you this. Do you have a knot in your thread? If you do not, get one today. And there's only one knot that'll do. It's not the knot of self-reliance or self-assurance. 
It's not the knot of independence, being on your own. My friend, it is the knot of Jesus Christ. We need him for everything. And without him, we have nothing. So be saved today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that you are the only way, that you are the knot in the end of our thread, that you are the hope, the only hope that we have in Jesus to live this life according to your will and way. Father, if there's someone who is lost today, we pray that you will use this opportunity to convict them of their sins and that they come to you for salvation today. And Father, all of us need to trust in you to celebrate in the midst of our difficulty that we have the hope that is only in Christ. And Father, I know there are people in this building today and there are people in our church family today that are experiencing great suffering, emotional distress, physical ailing, debilitating illnesses. But Father, you are our hope. And so whatever it is that we go through in this life, we know that we have a future in you. We know that this is not the end, but Father, we will be with you forever in your presence, receiving your incomparable glory showered upon us. And so Father, in this moment, help us, Lord, to celebrate your glory. And help it to strengthen us through our suffering. Help us, Lord. Oh, help us, Lord, because only you can. Thank you that we are heirs. We are heirs of God. And we are fellow heirs with Christ. And help us to celebrate that the sufferings of this world are incomparable with the glory that will be revealed. Help us, Lord, to worship you. Help us to come to you. Father, we give this moment to you. We give our hearts to you and we give our attention to you. And Father, I pray, God, that someone gives their life to you today. Father, we love you and thank you. And Lord, accept us just as we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing.
I was sitting here thinking about that song, as I was sitting here singing, I was thinking about how awesome God is, how worthy of our praise He is. As I look around this room, there's many stories in this room, many sufferings and difficulties, many joys and triumphs. We celebrated the triumphs of these graduates here this morning. But listen, God, through all of that, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a glorious God who didn't have to save us, but He did. Who didn't have to send His Son to die, but He did. And so I want us to just sing one more time. I want us to sing that verse, and I just want us to sing out to the God who pardoned us when we were guilty, who gave us life when we were broken, who lifted us up when we had nothing. And let us just praise him in this moment as we sing, I come broken. I come broken to be mended. I come Father, we praise you, Lord, for you are worthy of our praise. We are not worthy, but you have made us worthy. And we are not glorious, but you have given us your glory. And so, Father, we thank you as your creation, as your delivered ones, as your church. Help us, Lord, as we leave this place to be the gospel bearers to this community, to light bearers to this community. Father, we love you and we praise you. For your incomparable glory. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. This joy that I have. This joy that I have.